just for the audience's benefit, a reminder that of the things you listed at the beginning, not all are accomplishments. <laughs> fired we said, we said fired. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Grace. Thanks for inviting me on. I feel like I'm chatting with my business crash today. So just because I watched your talk with Fei Li at Stanford two years ago, and I was a huge fan of yours for like when you being the editor in chief at Wired. So it's been a journey for me. So on my end, I'm very, very excited to have you on today. That's great. And that was a wonderful, intense, complicated conversation. And part of what I remember is pretty rare to have a conversation about ethics and AI in a arena, right? It's yeah. it like, how many people came to that? It was great. I mean, obviously, they, they was, involved, there's a draw, but yeah, it was, it was a whole auditorium and nobody left before you guys left. So it was a great conversation. And so to start the show, I want to go through like a little bit of your personal history. So you got fired at CBS within an hour at your job. So you were a musician, you were a guitar artist in the subway. So you were kidnapped in Africa and you fought cancer. You were one of the fastest marathon runner and edited an article that turned into an Oscar winning film. And you started an award winning digital publication that sold to WordPress. So to start off the show, before we jump into all these amazing accomplishments, I want to know a little bit more about you, about how you grew up and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, just for the audience's benefit, a reminder that of the things you listed at the beginning, not all are accomplishments. Some of those things are neat and I'm proud of, some of them I'm not. I grew up in Boston. My father was a professor of foreign policy. My mother's a historian, you know, and as I wrote a lot about my paternal grandfather, who is a well-known arms negotiator, I've written a lot about my father who lived an immensely complicated life of traumas, trials, tribulations, despair. And there were a lot of forces shaping me from, you know, the intensity of my dad and all the troubles he went through to the ever-present love of my mother the example set by my paternal grandfather. Who knows, you know, what influences you the most over time, but those three forces clearly, really shaped everything I've, I've done since then. I grew up in, um, so I grew up in Boston. I ended up going to Stanford for college, went West, left home, absolutely loved it out there. And then after Stanford, I didn't quite know what to do. You know, I had been a very ambitious student and done all kinds of things in student government with student activism, but I hadn't really thought about what happened after college. And I think that's partly why I went from having a successful, exciting, rewarding four years at Stanford to just being dropped on my head by the real world. Yeah, I feel you. So, I mean, like, how can you plan so much as a student in the student government than like not thinking about what you are going to be doing after school? It's one of the strangest, you know, when I look back at that point in my life, it's one of the things that I don't understand about myself. And I don't understand why someone didn't grab me by the shoulder and say, Nick, you don't know what you're going to do when you're done. I had this vague notion that I would you know, go to graduate school and apply for, I had a Truman scholarship that would pay for some of graduate school. But, you know, the winter and spring of my senior year, I had this, I had no idea. I had this vague sense that I was going to go be a reporter for the Far East Economic Review, but I hadn't even been a reporter for the Standard Daily. And I didn't even know anybody at the Far East Economic Review. I remember telling people that that's what I was going to do, but like, it clearly wasn't what I was going to do. So yeah. I don't know. I don't, I really don't know the answer to that. I was so focused on school and so focused on all the things I was doing there. And I just, I think, I think the, maybe the best answer is I had a lot of self-confidence and figured that when I finished, it would be fine, that I would figure out what I was going to do. And I didn't realize that when I finished, I would be lost. Well, I mean, like now you're beyond fine. So <laughs> that was that. So, I mean, like, I want to jump ahead to your first real job. It's shows on your LinkedIn was Penguin Computing as a marketing director. So I mean, what's going on there? Um, how did that turn into like journalism? I know that you got rejected by CBS, like, like, I don't know, like an hour after you, I hear about like, you talk about like when you got on site and then like this gentleman who was running the 60 minutes literally told you that since you know nothing, we don't want to hire you or something like that. So yeah, um, yeah like how did your career start at wired and how do you get into like the writing thing yeah so as an undergraduate i had written op-eds i had written op-eds mm -hmm. for the school newspaper i had written op-eds for the new york times i had written a lot 
and I enjoyed writing. I had a summer internship at the National Park Service. I finished that. I then went to go play guitar in Boston, went back home. And during that time, I talked to a woman who worked at CBS and convinced her that I would be a good associate producer, which is a fairly substantial job for a 22 year old. Mm -hmm. And she hired me. So I moved down to New York. My girlfriend was in New York. It was very convenient. I bought these suits and I show up on West 57th Street. I walk into the office at orientation. I was going to work. So she worked for Steve Croft, who's one of the mm -hmm. well-known correspondents. Mm -hmm. And I went into a meeting, watched some video about gun violence. And then the head of the show pulls me in and says, who are you? I said, I'm Nick. I'm the new associate producer. And he's like, <laughs> you're what? He said, what have you done in television? I said, I haven't done anything in television. He said, show me your resume. So I print out my resume. My resume is like, Nick got good grades at Stanford, right? There's no resume, right? I haven't done anything. I interned at the National Park Service, right? Um, I have no, there's no justification. And he fired me on the spot. Like, and, and, and again, I think I didn't respond the way I should have responded, which is, hell no, like you hired me. You can't just hire me. I just sort of walked out the door and was like, okay. And I still like, you know, I've been a correspondent for CBS, was a course correspondent for CBS for five, six years. And still, every time I go down West 57th, I'm a, like a little, I still have that feeling of walking out into the sunshine that day. It must've been December of 1997, totally lost. So that happened. And then, you know, the woman who had hired me said, well, maybe we can get your job on the evening news, but that didn't happen. So I then, one of my best friends from college was going to Africa. And he had won a Marshall scholarship and was taking six months before starting that. And so I said, Hey, can I come with you? And he's like, sure. You gotta get some vaccines. So I go and you know, go to the doctor, get vaccines, get an airplane ticket. And I decide I'll like make some money while I'm there by writing stories, you know? And so I write to various travel editors, foreign correspondents. And, you know, again, I'm sort of ambitious and aggressive at that point in my life. And I make a lot of connections and I go all kinds of crazy things happen, but I also write some stories and I write, you know, I end up I get kidnapped in Morocco, write about that. And so by the time I return to the United States, I actually have written a few things. So I come back and then work with my dad on a book. I work as an intern at the Environmental Defense Fund. I play a lot of guitar. It's the peak of my music career. And then a friend of mine from college had started this really cool company called Penguin Computing, which is Linux hardware. Mm -hmm. It still exists, actually. And he had been the director of a school play that I had been. He had directed Rosie Jack and Gildenstern are dead. And I had been Rosencrantz. He's a lovely, smart, crazy guy. And so he started this Linux hardware company and I'm not a fool. Like it's 1990, by then it's 1999. And you can tell that the internet is exploding in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. And like all my friends from college, right? it turns out like a whole bunch of them have like gone and founded this small company called Google, right? Or you know, mm -hmm. gone to work at this small company called Google, right? This woman who lived, you know, just in the dorm next and I used to see on the Skywalks named Marissa Mayer. It's like one of the early, like, you know, Google starts on campus there. All kinds of things start mm -hmm. on campus there, right? And so I'm like, well, Linux, right? Linux is a, the idea of open source is a politically powerful idea, right? And I was very politically far left at this moment. And the idea of open source software, challenging the man, challenging Microsoft, challenging the way capitalism worked was extremely appealing. And the idea of like going into the apex of capitalism to challenge capitalism was very fun. And so I went to go to Penguin Computing and he made me director of marketing, which didn't mean anything. I was just one of like 10 employees. And, um, you know, I learned how to build a computer. I learned how to raise VC funding. I mean, it's crazy. I remember, I vividly remember showing up and he like pulled me into like, we we're raising money my first week on the job. And one of the senior people in the company had been away. And so I go to a meeting with a VC and it's me, the CEO, this other guy named also named Nick. And I realized like halfway through the meeting that Nick, doesn't know who I am and that I'm not a VC, that I actually work for the same company. <laughs> um, it was hilarious, right? It is just, it's height of Silicon Valley hilarity, right? And, you know, we're a small company losing money. We're like, should we go public? So I worked there for a while, but then because I had written a bunch of stories, mm -hmm. I get offered, and, you know, I get pulled back into writing. I get a call from someone who works in the White House asking if I will apply to be a speechwriter for Bill Clinton. And then I get a call from someone asking if I want to interview to be the editor of the Washington Monthly. Right? You know, the early stories have been good. People liked them. And so I go down the track of interviewing to be a White House speechwriter. And I go down the track of applying to be editor of the Washington Monthly. And eventually they hire me at the Washington Monthly. And so I leave Silicon Valley life. 
I go back east, which is a good move because my wife was starting graduate school. My, not my wife, then my girlfriend, now my wife. <laughs> She's been living with me in San Francisco, but she was starting graduate school in New York. So I was pulled by professional opportunity, pulled by love, all that stuff. So I moved back east and I started as an editor at the Washington Monthly. And that's how I got into journalism. So it's a little bit of a wayward, confusing path, but from there, it's pretty straight, right? From there, it's, I'm an editor, watch monthly, I write stories, I edit stories, and I have different periods in my life where I write, different periods where I edit, and now I'm a bureaucrat. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's a fairly common trajectory, writer to editor to bureaucrat. Mm-hmm. I have a really personal question for you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you graduated from Stanford, like looking at all your friends who are, you mentioned like Maurice Myers or like a bunch of people went to work at Google. Do you ever feel like, oh, you know, I could have worked at Google or do you think, obviously you are very successful today, but like, would you ever thought, what if I could have gone down to technology route? Or Yeah, and I, I think about it in two contexts, right? So mm-hmm. one, there's always this like, it would have made a lot of money, right? I mean, you know, I worked at this Linux hardware company. I had a good friend who worked at a different Linux hardware company who made $700 million, right? Like if I had worked at his Linux hardware company, you know, you know, my great grandchildren would be, you know, school would be paid for. So sometimes you wonder that, right? And I wondered it more, of course, when I was younger and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in a less senior job where the differential was, you know, but I also think about it in a more interesting way, which is I often wonder, why did I miss that, right? Because the reason why it would have been interesting to work at Google in 1998 isn't just that I would have gotten fabulously wealthy, presumably, but that you know Google is the collective human consciousness, right? It's a phenomenally interesting thing to work on, right? And if you look at what actually happened in 1998 that shaped the world we live in today, you know, it's not my coverage of the 2000 presidential campaign, though that was interesting and influential to some degree. It's not, maybe was it the work on carbon taxes that I did at Environmental Defense on that interesting consequential, but like by far the most important stuff was what happened in Silicon Valley, right? Whether it's Google or any of another company. So the question is, why did I miss that? Why when, if you had asked Nick in 1999, what is the most important thing happening today? I probably would have talked about you know, democratic justice in Burma and the screen of Aung San Suu Kyi, right? Which turns out I actually had mm-hmm. wrong, like Aung San Suu Kyi, I didn't understand what was going to happen in Burma. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have talked about, you know, search as an organizing principle for the way humanity works. So I sometimes think, okay, so I missed that. You know, it was right, happening right in front of my face, right? To see what's in front of one's face takes a constant struggle, right? And so then the question is, okay, so I missed that in 1999. So what is happening right now that I'm missing? What is the thing that you know, 15 years from now, I'll be like, God, you know, like, why didn't I notice how important that was going to be? So that's often how I think about it. Why didn't I see how much that was going to matter? I'm curious, like, I mean, because you've worked in like journalism for so long, I'm sure you love what you do now. And do you think it was because of like your passion for the political arena and like you care about these like justice issues or like because of you like writing, because of you like thinking about things. So you kind of pick this career route, you kind of like that kind of like just make you ignore the rest. Do you think it was because of your passion that drives you or do you think it's more because of, oh, I got a job here and like, you know, I keep doing something like this. It's interesting. You know, it's probably some of each. And there's some interesting elements to both parts of that question. So first on the passion question, when I started in journalism, I was much more, I viewed my responsibility as much more shaping debate as opposed to explaining issues, like partly how young people approach journalism today versus old people. But my my perspective shifted quite a bit. You know, I worked at the Washington Monthly, which very much had the view that, you know, you talk to everybody you could to understand an issue, but then you'd also explain the way you think that works. And over time, my opinion shifted much more to journalists need to take whatever they think the right answer is and like eject it from their mind and just present the most faithful reading of the facts that they can, which of course is always impossible in certain situations, not practical or not moral, but my perspective on that issue, the journalism as a way to shape political societal views on particular issues has changed. My view of the civic importance of journalism, right? In my general sense that the world is a better place, democracy functions better if there are more journalists doing the best work they possibly can. That has held steady, in fact, only gotten stronger. That's part of it. But part of why I pursued it professionally and stuck with it is less that, though that's part of it. And it's more that I've always been a little bit 
you know, people fall on different spectrums, right? Like foxes, hedgehogs isn't quite the right thing, but like, do you do one thing or do you do many things, right? Mm -hmm. And their trade-offs, not, it's not like one answer is better than the other. But I was always someone who had a lot of different projects going, right? And who, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like, you know, even in college, it wasn't like, I'm going to have one major and fully focus on, I'm going to do like a ton of things. And journalism is a great career. You have that kind of curiosity mind, that's the way your head works. Like, it can't be a good career if you have the, you know, the hedgehog philosophy and you really dig into one topic and you spend 10 years mm -hmm. writing a book. But it can be really great because, you know, in my life, I've gotten to report in Africa, I've gotten to travel. Like I just got to, I don't know, fly to Paris and do a whole bunch of interesting interviews there. Like you really get to explore it. The Washington Monthly, you know, I was there for two years and we came out monthly. I wrote a story, I don't know, 20 stories and 24 issues, each of which I chose like a different crazy topic and spent a month studying it to the best I could and writing about it, which is kind of an amazing intellectual experience. So I think the career, I stuck with it because it's such a good career. And then also, you know, I didn't realize this when I was young, but journalism is, it has this advantage in that it's extremely meritocratic, right? In that when you're 23 years old, it is much easier to advance as a journalist than it is in most other professions. Cause you can write a story, someone can read the story and think it's good. Like it is very hard to advance in the law because you have to go to law school and you have to mm -hmm. learn legalese and then you have to sort of apprentice at a firm. You can't become a great doctor at 24. Like you can't become a well-known doctor, right? You have to go to med school, right? You have to actually <laughs> learn how the human body works, right? And in most professions, it takes a long time and mm -hmm. it takes sort of credentialism and this and that. Journalism, you know, you can just go. And that's great when you're 24, but it also like your disadvantages, right? It means there's a constant churn in journalism. It is very hard to be an old journalist, right? In part because constantly getting replaced. Like if you're a lawyer, you know, you're not getting replaced all the time. <laughs> the other problem with journalists, of course, is the field is declining. And that there's no way to see that in 1999. I mean, without really understanding the internet. So it's been interesting to work in this field that is so great in your 20s or can be so great in your 20s. I have my own struggles in my 20s. But that's, you know, relative to those other fields I mentioned, a little more, a little harder in your 40s, right? Because let's, again, compared to the law. Mm -hmm. I gone to law school, gone to a law firm, maybe made partner, maybe not, but like you're then locked in and set, like you'd be set. Like my friends who took that route didn't have as glamorous a career in their twenties, but they're locked until their sixties, right? Like I could get fired tomorrow and, you know, journalism again, cause it's so meritocratic and so much constant churn. It's complicated. I feel you. I know that you also like, you got into like NYU law school, right? Like curious, like when you were making career decisions, like who do you bounce off ideas with? You know, you obviously through journalism, you have met many of these like world famous technologists or like leaders. Who do you consider as on your personal board of advisors? Yeah, that's a good question. So there have only been a few times where I've had a real choice. The most interesting one was that one. So that was the summer of 2005. And my journalism career at that point had had some ups and downs, right? It had gone extremely mm -hmm. well until about 2001. And then I'd gone off to be a freelance writer and I was pretty good, but I wasn't great. No, I didn't <laughs> actually have a, an earth shattering story. I didn't have a prize winning investigation. I didn't uncover anything. You know, and then I had gone and been an editor at this publication on legal affairs, which is wonderful, a great mentor named Lynn Kaplan. And I got really interested in the law. And so I was thinking, you know, this journalism thing is good, but it's not perfect. If I'm going to leave now, you know, I'm almost 30. I should apply to law school and just go, right? And then I'll do three years at law school. And, you know, then sort of the same thing I said before, like I'll be, you know, behind all my peers to some small degree, but who cares, right? Like I'll just have to spend the next eight years with my head down and then I'll have all kinds of great options. So I applied to law school and you know, I had to get back to New York. I had been working in New Haven. My wife has always been in New York. My wife's a dancer and a dance historian. She's not leaving New York. So I need to get back to New York. I was thinking of leaving journalism. And then simultaneously, two other things happened. My grandfather, the arms negotiator, died in fall of 2004. And then George Kennan died in I think, April 2005. And I had been reading the obituary of Kennan. And I thought, oh my God, I didn't realize how close his life was to my grandfather's. And I suddenly had this concept for a book, which would be to tell the history of America during the Cold War mm -hmm. by tracing the dynamic between George Kennan and my grandfather, Paul Nitzel. I would have all access to it because my grandfather why uh, do you guys have different last names? Is that your mom's dad? Grand my mom's dad. Yeah. Okay. So my mom grew up in Nitsa, married my dad, Thompson. Mm -hmm. And so I had that. And then in the summer of 2005, I got an email from a guy named Bob Cohen saying, hey, I've heard you're a good editor. Do you want to apply to be an associate editor at Wired? And mm -hmm. so that summer, I had three options, right? Go to mm -hmm. law school, write a book, 
potentially get this job at Wired. And so I had to adjudicate or I had to weigh all those different options. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it fairly quickly because I had to start at school in August. And it's definitely the most professionally consequential weekend of my life. So back to the question, who is my board of advisors? Then, you know, I've always called lots of different people of expertise, different people at mm -hmm. different times. I remember talking to my dad. I remember talking to Link Kaplan. I remember talking to lots of my wife. And so then I decided that I, you know, I decided to defer law school, apply for the wire job and write the book. And I ended up getting the wire job mm -hmm. and writing the book it went well. So that locked me in. So that was by far the most professionally consequential because it was, you know, had I woken up on the other side of the bed one morning in August of 2005, I got the lawyer right now. Yeah. I'm so glad you're not a lawyer. <laughs> Who knows? Uh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like speaking of like getting into journalism or like speaking of like having a successful career, what do you see as one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? Because I feel like journalism, a lot of people will imagine it's writing, but I feel like a lot of it was like research, thinking, planning ahead, and just there's like a lot of different skills that could make you successful. Also, I feel like right now you are also like a leader, right? So you worked as editor in chief at Wired, and then you are the CEO right now at the Atlantic. So what do you value as a skill that could make someone successful? Yeah, there are lots of skills I'm constantly working at. You know, I am probably every day I'm trying to work through. I mean, I think one of the key things with a job like this and in an age of the internet, of course, is time management, right? So how do you, how do you manage your to-do list so that you are spending the maximum amount of time during the day doing the most mm -hmm. important things, right? Mm -hmm. And that is like constantly complicated and I'm constantly sort of reworking the systems I use to do that. Writing is such an interesting example. So I didn't actually think about writing skill that much when I was younger. And I don't think I was that great at writing. My, my mom just actually gave me all my grade school reports. And like, I got worse grades in writing because I was, watching, I was good at math that way. And then I developed kind of a funny voice in college, like working for the humor magazine, writing up ads, like a way, like a little bit of a, a tone and a style, but I don't, I don't think it was a really terrific one. And then I think it was, you know, I worked at the New Yorker after my first stint at Wired. And I think it was there that I really started to pay attention because I had always thought myself as a pretty good writer and pretty confident in my writing, but you go to the New Yorker and you realize, no, these people are all better. Right. Like they're legitimately, you know, you're in the, of the people on staff here, you are in the 30th percentile as a writer, right? If you were like, someone came and gave a talk and you're asked to write a paragraph about it, your, your paragraph would be. And so there was a moment at the New Yorker, you know, I worked there four years where I really focused on trying to figure out how it was done. And I would take the writers I loved and I would read their stories out loud to myself. Right. And I would take the copy edits. I'd try to really understand what I wasn't doing well. And I'd try to understand like, here are some of the weaknesses in the way I write, you know, here's where I tend to choose overall metaphors. Here's where I tend to, you know, write stories that begin in a way that leads the writer astray. Oh, like here's how the master of narrative structure does it. Okay, wait, here's how the master of senses does it. And so I spent a ton of time trying to study that craft and I got better. You know, I didn't, I'm not a famous writer, right? But I did get a lot better at the New Yorker. And that was a moment. I mean, what's interesting about that is not just, you know, what I did try to get better as a writer, but it was... I'm glad I did that, right? I'm glad I recognized one of the things in any job you're in is recognizing what you're good at, what you're not good at, and then, you know, building up your weaknesses. If you build up your weaknesses, you build up your strengths, right? This is something you learn when you're in sports, you're doing anything, right? Do you focus on what you're bad at? You focus on what you're good at. And so I'm in the same process in my current job. I'm CEO of the Atlantic. And I had a realization last week or the week before, and I was like, you know, I'm pretty good at some of these parts of the job, but you know, I'm not good at understanding how you sell and present the Atlantic to advertisers, right? If I meet an advertiser at a conference, I'm not good at ending the conversation with us getting closer to a partnership. And so I've been thinking a lot about how I can get better at that. And so I've had a lot of conversations over the last week or two weeks with our chief revenue officer and trying to dig more into that private side of the business. So, you know, it's a process of trying to understand your strengths and weaknesses and improving your weaknesses in whatever role you're in. So actually maybe the thing that is, I don't know, a valuable lesson with a thing that I believe, but don't always perfectly execute is identify what you're not good at, where there are people at the organization who are better at it, and then try to learn from them. I love that. I feel like there's a, uh, when you mentioned about like, you know, you may not be like as good as like talking to advertisers as you could be, but I feel like there's so many questions around that. I feel like great journalism or great content in general shouldn't be, I guess, like a vehicle for like, I guess, getting a lot of money, but like, you also need the money to run the show, right? Like, so yeah. How do you balance that out? I know that like it's easy to just find the chief revenue officer from 
somewhere and then like chat with them. But like, there's also a lot of conflict. Let's say like, let's use podcasting as an example. I could produce like five episodes per week and I could get like advertisers to be on the show or something, but that would like sacrifice the quality of the show. How do you make sure you don't sacrifice like what you guys stand for, which is why people are coming in to you in the first place, but also like, you know, make a smart money decision that you don't make the show just go away because of you guys are like, oh. it's a great question. And it's a huge problem. And there are a hundred ways that that choice and those trade-offs affect my job, but there are two that are probably the most prevalent. So the first is exactly the trade-off you mentioned, right? And this, again, I'm the CEO of The Atlantic. I'm not the editor-in-chief, so I don't choose how much content we have, but certainly at Wired, there is a trade-off between producing the most number of stories and Mm -hmm. producing the best stories. You don't want to produce so many stories that you dilute them or you get sloppy and you run a risk of reputation damage. Mm -hmm. You also don't want to be so pristine that you never publish anything because you go out of business. And so there's this constant (laughs) trade-off between like, you know, getting, and the same thing is true with the New Yorker, right? And Mm -hmm. I mean, David Remnick would, you know, you think of the New Yorker as the place that publishes only the finest stories, but Remnick was like, you know, he would say, okay, let's, you gotta get this done in an hour. Like, just do this, finish it, right? Like, Nick, how are your stories coming? Do they have a quality of doneness? And the quality of doneness. Yeah. I remember, like, I, I, I think I remember him like being there and like, like, I think, Nick, I'm, I'm hearing you, but what I would like with this story is I would like it to be done. Um, so, you know, and there was a real intensity there. So part of what I'm trying to, what I would try to do as editor in chief is to make sure people have the time they need, but also make sure people actually do it and finish it, right? And mm-hmm. publish a lot. And so that's a hard balance and you're constantly, I don't think there's a simple rule. One thing that is helpful is having a business model that supports quality. You know, subscription-based business model does have a tendency to do that. Right, the things that drive subscriptions are really great stories. The things that drive other kinds of revenue are higher volume. So it's useful to align the incentives, but then it's also useful to just hire really efficient, efficient people. The other way that this trade-off comes up though, the trade-off you mentioned is in the kinds of ad deals you take, right? So advertisers, it used to be very simple, right? The role of a publisher, you go and you go to the Mets game with an advertiser and they would then buy a bunch of pages in the magazine or a bunch of boxes on the website. Now it's different. They want, you know, branded content or they want you to help them launch a podcast or you, they want to use your Twitter feed to promote their products. You know, the whole advertising world, it's not just the advertising revenue has gone, you know, to Google and Facebook, it's just become way more complicated. And so you have to make sure that you are helping your advertising partners with what they need without taking too much time with the editorial staff and the writers, because then they can't write any stories without doing anything that confuses readers, right? You can't produce sponsored content that people think is editorial content. And then you can't also, you have to maintain certain values, right? Like you don't want to, I don't know, take an advertisement about the importance of journalism ethics from the government of Saudi Arabia. So, you know, you just have to weigh those trade-offs. Yeah. So speaking of the trade-offs, as a CEO, and then previously your role at Wire was editor-in-chief, what's the differences? And assuming the CEO will both like, I guess, like have an eye on the content as well as like making sure the company is run pro- like profitably and functionally to you, what's your day-to-day like? And does that mean like every day you're like sitting in front of a spreadsheet or do you think it's more like you act as, um, I guess, like the company's phase to go to different events like you know what does it look like for me well so i guess maybe it's easier to explain it this way so at wired i had two things i did so i ran editorial side so i would approve the stories i would choose the writers choose the editors play a role in all those choices read the stories before they ran say do this don't do that and then i would also try to set the business model right set priorities we should have a paywall we should run affiliate business you know this sponsored content campaign is good this one is bad and, you know, and along that, like HR, right, you know, the assistant editor is fighting with the art director, like who wins? At the Atlantic, it's kind of all bucket B, but more of it, right? And so <laughs> I'm, I don't actually assign, I don't even go to the story meetings. I don't read anything before it appears online. I don't, you know, if Jeff Goldberg, who's the editor in chief, mm-hmm. wants my opinion on a story or a writer, he's allowed to ask me, but I'm not allowed to ask him. That's the way we set it up. There's like a one-way door. So I never go in and say, hey, I really think you should assign Bob a story on, you know, spider larvae. You know, but if Jeff comes in, it's like, hey, we assigned Bob a story on spider larvae. I know you've written about it before. What do you think I can answer? So Jeff really, Jeff and the editorial team do what they do. I do read it, of course, and I tweet the stories and I love the stories and I love Mm -hmm. the writers and, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm friends with some of the writers and editors, but that's not my job. So like this morning, you know, what did I, what exactly did I do? Like we're having a discussion about, you know, some employee benefits and some of the complicated trade-offs where 
figuring out, you know, change and, you know, how we fill an open headcount on the product side. We're doing a presentation to the board on our, you know, H1 financials, right? So it's, it's kind of like what you said before. I have an Excel spreadsheet open all day. <laughs> do you enjoy this or do you enjoy like actually creating content? Because I feel like people got into journalism because they love creating stuff. But I also feel like I understand that, you know, at each stage of your career, you probably have a different goals, regardless yeah. if it's because of you want personal improvement or like you feel like this is the right thing to do. Do you really enjoy being the CEO? Because I feel like it's being a CEO, it's like a completely different game. It's like you are doing a lot of management stuff. It's like the less sexy stuff unless like, you are creating a product. I feel like editor in chief, it's like a chief product officer of your thing. And then that's yeah. like why people are coming at you, right? Like, but CEO, it's like, Oh, every day, like you have to deal with so many like random tasks. That's like not even related to creating content. That is all true. The way you describe the CEO job, like that is very much the <laughs> CEO job. You know, I've only had this job for four months and I took it because the prospect of trying to make the Atlantic, which has existed since 1857, financially mm -hmm. stable and sustainable is an incredible challenge, an incredibly worthy thing to do, right? So if I mm -hmm. succeed and the Atlantic becomes financially sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. We have done something wonderful, I think, for the world and for journalism and for everything. So I am motivated by that project. So in a way, no, I'm not editing stories, assigning stories, writing stories, editing stories. But my role is, you know, from a long-term perspective, you know, equally as important and wonderfully challenging. You know, will I do this job for 50 years? Probably not. I mean, not 50, it's not a credit. <laughs> no, we're all going to be dead. Five <laughs> years, right? Probably not. I'll probably write again, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what was so interesting about this job is that it's a rare opportunity to be a CEO, but also like still be involved in journalism and the business I love. So I get mm -hmm. the opportunity. Like, I love being editor chief of Wired. I love Wired. I love working there. I love working at Con and Ask. If you know, someone had come and said, hey, do you want to be CEO of a 300 person, you know, company selling socks, right? Or making Linux hardware, I would have said no, right? I was really the opportunity to stay, to try the CEO role and to stay in this business that I love. Yeah. So not that I have anything against socks. <laughs> so curious. So you started a company with two other people and you yeah. sold it to WordPress. And what was that journey like? And you're really friendly with the technology. Like you're posting on LinkedIn. You have like 1.5 million followers on LinkedIn. You're posting almost every day, like multiple times per day sometimes. What did that experience tell you? And then like, when did you start it? Realize that like, even as an editor-in-chief or even as a CEO, you have to like build a brand online. Those are both good questions. So what did I learn from the Atavist? So I found it with two friends. We founded the Atavis was when I worked mm -hmm. at Wired the first time before I went to the New Yorker. It was right mm -hmm. when the iPad came out, right before the iPad came out. We had this dream mm -hmm. of building a magazine optimized for multimedia. We thought the future of storytelling would be you read something, then you watch part of it, then you listen to part of it. It's so um, beautiful. It's so beautifully so done. Right? Yeah, it's beautiful and it was, guy. you know, what we did right is we completely anticipated mm -hmm. the direction that sort of journalism design would go in, you know, and we pioneered all the stuff that the New York Times would later make very famous with Snowfall and all that. So we did a great job of that. We did a great job of building software to do that, right? So we mm -hmm. had this idea, we realized we couldn't, existing software didn't make, it didn't work. So we built our own software. So that was great, like A plus in both those categories. What we didn't do a great job of is turning it into a company at scale, right? We had this very quaint notion that we should try to make money. And so we would sell our software. And, you know, none of us knew how to sell. So you know, we hired other people to sell, but we weren't great at selling. We licensed our product. We raised venture capital funding. They didn't quite understand how to raise venture capital funding. We went through all of the crazy, remember at one point, you know, somebody offered to buy the company at a, what looked like at a extraordinary sum. And we were like, wow, we've made it. Look at this. And then we you know, take the term sheet. We send it to one of our investors. They're like, they're not offering to buy the company. They're offering to take over the company and recapitalize it with you getting nothing. And we were like, oh, that's not a great deal. You know, so we went through a lot of sort of crazy twists and turns with venture capitalists. You know, we made a very, made a big deal with one investor who wanted the company to go in a direction that we weren't certain about, but it seemed like a good idea. Maybe it wasn't a great idea. Who knows? You know, so it was seven, eight years. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of drama, a lot of ups and downs. We at one point had a lot of employees. Other points we had fewer employees. <laughs> And it ended with a happy ending in that, you know, we sold the WordPress and, you know, the software lives on in WordPress. You know, the people whose 
built their sites and their products using the Atavist, you know, live on. We created a magazine that lives on. So it was a great journey with a lot of ups and downs and thousands of lessons. And I learned, I, you know, I don't know, you know, how cap tables work. So I started at the Atavist. I feel you. Them. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my um, God. I didn't, I didn't understand, you know, the understand like the dilutions. I didn't understand what post money meant. You know, there are all these mm-hmm. things that like I helped cover cap, right? I understood options, but I didn't understand a lot of the micro stuff. So there's a lot that I learned in the Atavist. To the second part of the question about a personal brand, you know, I post on social media. I do daily videos on the most interesting thing in tech. I, you know, I post on Twitter. I retweet stories. I have like a lot of services I use to try to understand you know, what's trending. And it's, partly about building a personal brand. It's also partly an awareness that like as editor in chief or CEO or as employee, part of my job is to get readers and like Mm -hmm. the old way to get readers, which is publish a print magazine, the postal service delivers it and people read it. Like that died a long time ago. The thing that came after that, which is you publish a website on a URL and people will bookmark it. That died a long time ago too. So, you know, and I post on Reddit all the time, right? Like I'm trying to understand (laughs) the only way to understand how something works in my mind or the best way to understand how something works is to use it. Like you can't yeah. go to a presentation on Reddit, <laughs> understand how Reddit drives traffic. You have to post a hundred stories in different mm-hmm. subreddits and see and like realize what the rules are and where you get blowback and like what mm-hmm. headlines work and which ones don't and like timing. So I'm constantly just trying to learn like, and I, I you know, there are ways I could do better. Like I, I'm not active on TikTok. I probably should be active on TikTok. Like maybe it'd be <laughs> active for the Atlantic. So you can, you can film like a, you run, right? Like every day you run to work and then you run back and then you can just Film that. Second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would see that on TikTok. Really? Yeah. You might be the only one. I don't know. Okay, I'll try that one day. Run uh, with Nick or something like run, that. Yeah, run with Nick every day. <laughs> yeah, that, I, mean, I put on my, I have a go, one of my kids has a GoPro. I'll do that. So anyway, so yeah, it's partly about building a personal brand, but it never started as building a personal brand. It started as like trying to drive traffic. You know, LinkedIn, it just popped. Like, you know, for whatever reason, my personality or the style of posting works really well mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. So I have you know, tons of followers there, way more than Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> Instagram, like, I don't know how to, I don't, I'm not good at Instagram, right? I'm, you know, the I whole, think you're great at it compared to people your age. No offense. Compared to my age, hilarious. I don't know. I feel like, again, I'm in the 30th percentile on Instagram <laughs> But I'm in like the much higher percentile for LinkedIn users for, you know, ability to post stuff that people like. Like speaking of like the new age of media. So if you and I are starting at Wired or at Atlantic, like what yeah. would you suggest us to do? Like, do you think the content should be because like this is a complicated question because we just chat about like being the CEO and being the editor in chief, right? Like, so do you think the awesome content comes first or do you think the ads money comes first? Because I feel like to have advertising money or to be rich in media almost means you have to create the content that advertisers wants to buy or wants to show up on. And then it's very different than like you create the most quality content that like smart people want to consume. So even if you're like a really influential thinker you still have to figure out how to make money like if you and i are starting like a new publication or like a new magazine or like a new blah 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 daily like how would you kind of go about it well it depends right so i mean what i would do is i would start with okay so you and i are starting the blah 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 with daily I mean, <laughs> grace i think it'll be good so our first question is you know we start with the premise Start with the premise of what are you and I most excited about? So what do we want the blah, blah, blah daily to be about, right? And you and I choose because if we don't choose something we're passionate about, like we'll never, mm-hmm. we won't work hard enough on it. We won't be able to sell it. So mm-hmm. forget about the money for a minute. You know, blah, blah, blah will be about the thing we like the most. So then we do that. And then once we've got that, then we choose the business model that most fits it, right? So if we decide that we're going to write only about poverty and injustice in America, probably not going to get advertising dollars, right? You know, we're like, we're going to devote our publication to leprosy, right? Like besides like hospitals, you're not going to get a lot of advertising. So then we have to go to like a foundation route or we have to, you know, find a wealthy patron, right? Or, mm-hmm. you know, try to get subscriptions, maybe at a high price for people who want to support that kind of journalism. Like you get basically mm-hmm. people that you, you find, you build a business model around people supporting the moral value of your work. Let's say though, instead we decide that our passion is we're going to write about inspiring, you and I are really passionate about doing a publication about inspiring innovators at small businesses, right? Like mm-hmm. advertising money is going to come like in the door tomorrow, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, then we don't need to worry about foundation funding. We don't need to worry about patients. We just need to go and, you know, call big advertisers, right? So mm-hmm. I think it's more if we're starting a new publication to adjust, figure out the passion, then adjust the business model after that. So then when you come to something like the Atlantic, it's really interesting because if you're thinking about like, what is the next vertical the Atlantic should launch? If you want to start a poverty and justice vertical, 
well, could be great for the brand, could drive tons of subscriptions, not going to drive a ton of advertisers. Right? You want to do a innovative small business vertical, great mm -hmm. for advertisers, but not really what the journalists want to do. So it's this constant push and pull of identifying what people are passionate about and then building a business around it. So like you mentioned so many different things, so like there's a the content side and then there's like the business model side. Let's start with the content side of things. You have done, like you have like write for so many different magazines, like Bloomberg News, CNN, New Yorker, Wire, CBS News, and now the Atlantic. Like they all kind of like share like different vibe. They're, they have different vibe, right? Like, so their stories are like, have really different style and tone to them. How do you come up with like your own tone for like things that you write? And how do you make sure that since you're contributing to so many different things, like how do you make sure that you kind of have the tone in whatever they're focusing on as well as like having your own journalism style? Yeah. So I think that, I mean, most of those publications I wrote for, you know, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote a lot for Boston Globe News, mm -hmm. both then, and it was news reporting, right? And so mm -hmm. you adapt to the tone, you figure out the tone. It was before I had gone through that sort of exercise in the New Yorker where I was shaping my writing. Now my writing is much, you know, there probably aren't that many publications where my writing style would, would fit mm -hmm. in. You know, I don't know if I could, I, if I quit my job tomorrow and applied to be a tech reporter at the Post Times or journals and was lucky enough that they hired me, like, it would be interesting. I might, my editors might be like, come on, Nick, like put the information at the very top, right? Like, come on, where's your nut graph, right? And I'd be like, oh my God, I forgot how to write a nut graph. So I think I've kind of come up with a, I have a somewhat distinctive voice, you know, based on the last 10 years of trying to shape it, writing style. And it probably works, you know, I would like to think it works at the Atlantic. It certainly worked at Wired, worked at the New Yorker. So, you know, if I ever went back to freelance writing, I'd probably start trying to write for those places. But if it didn't, you know, if I couldn't make a living doing that, or, you know, it just didn't sink, then I would have to figure out how to write in different voices. I mean, one of the challenges in journalism is, you know, really shaping, and it's not so much the style, it's the story idea and the story sensibility. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a news reporter, you have to look at different things and do different things from if you're a magazine reporter. It's a really interesting thing. And it would actually be hard. It would be hard to go back to trying to do, if you gave me the list of assignments on my to-do list in 2002, I don't know if I could do them now. Yeah. I feel like also like these publications, they all change throughout times. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't really know how they stay consistent with their tone of voice. I don't know how these works just because like, you know, even like when you think about like the, like, let's say Forbes and Fortune, they all have different kind of tones and yeah. They do, it, I mean, they, do. they have really different tones. I mean, it's like the New Yorker has a very similar tone because it's had the same five people running it for 20 years. You know, it's the New Yorker has not it's the same group of people. They're all geniuses. They're all beloved. I adore them all. And they particular sensibility and they've trained people. And the New Yorker also doesn't hire people with distinctive outside voices, right? The New Yorker is not going to hire a famous outsider with a distinctive voice. The New Yorker is going to hire a promising young person, train them in the New Yorker voice, and then the person becomes famous. The New Yorker has done a fabulous job of that. And the voice changes at all kinds of publications, like the voice of the New York Times, right? It's it changed a ton over the last five years. It became vastly, you know, the New York Times is a vastly more ideological paper than it was five years ago, right? And that is a change in style, but also a change in voice, right? The way stories are written now is different from the way they were written five years ago, and it will continue to evolve over the next few years. Now, it's hard. The New York Times doesn't, of course, have one voice, right? It still has people who've been writing for it for mm -hmm. 300 years or however long they've been doing it. They probably have reporters who've been there for 45 years. But yeah, publications evolve in complicated, interesting, wonderful ways. Yeah. Speaking of publications evolving, so like the technology is changing too. So I wired. So when after you got to work, you launched a successful paywall and a Snapchat channel and AMP stories editions. So those are a lot of different kind of like products, right? So when you think about these products, when you look at these like, you know, Forbes launching lists every single day, and then there's other or like maybe like Vogue is like really bullish on like YouTube videos. When you look at peers in your industry, how do you kind of self-identify like what kind of content that you should be doing and yeah. what vertical you should launch to make people, I guess, like you more? And then, I, by the way, I also really like when I think I saw a lot of like YouTubers on Wired, like I'm not going to name specific names since David Dobrik is going down right now, but like, um, okay. yeah. That was controversial. Yeah, we, I mean, we did do that. So that's a, a really interesting question. So one of my challenges at Wired and at the Atlantic is identifying where readers are going to go, where advertising revenue is going to go. Mm -hmm. You know, 
right now, the Atlantic mm-hmm. could launch a big video channel. If we did a big video channel, we could do documentary films. We could do short YouTube videos. We could mm-hmm. do short films attached to our stories. We could be super ambitious about podcasts. We could be super ambitious about newsletters. We could really push hard on TikTok. We could you know, devote ourselves to Instagram stories. We could translate mm-hmm. all our stories into Spanish, right? There's like, there are 50 different things that we could do, mm-hmm. all of which are appealing. And so my job is to you know, figure out which three of those will do, right? And then to prioritize. At Wired, you know, went through the same process. It's a little easier to talk about because we went through the process. So the first thing we did is we said, we're going to make launch a paywall, right? Advertising revenue, the long-term prospects are complicated. I had experience from helping to launch the New Yorker paywall. So I came in basically day one was like, we're launching a paywall, right? made it a huge priority. One year after I started, we launched it. Thank God we did. You know, it's a big part of why Wired has a bright future. Along the way, and slightly more haphazardly, we launched basically an affiliate revenue business where we review products, you know, and you buy one, we get a share of the sale price. And it was, that was more of a like, oh yeah, we should be doing this. We review products. It wasn't like Nick came in and was like, let's do this. But what was so interesting with it is that it became phenomenally successful, right? It made millions of dollars. And so, you know, you could look back at Nick's tenure and be like, wow, Nick really diverse, the, the revenue streams really diversified under Nick. And <laughs> that is true. And I should take credit for deliberately, you know, planning out and launching mm-hmm. Paywall. To mm-hmm. the extent it was affiliate revenue, it was kind of like good fortune. And then we launched some things like the Snapchat channel. We ended up shutting down, you know, the revenue wasn't worth it. Maybe, mm-hmm. I think we actually underestimated Snapchat's, you know, we launched it when Snapchat was high, stopped it when Snapchat mm-hmm. was low, didn't realize Snapchat would come back. And the YouTube thing was incredibly interesting, right? So we wired had a YouTube channel and- It's good. Had, it's a good channel. It's, good. it's a good channel, right? And it's a really hard mix because- you know, the stuff that like the core of the sort of traditional wired journalists want to do, which is like, let's do a deep investigation of AI and put it on YouTube. Like you can't make that. Ec- or yeah, no one's going to watch know it. how to make that economic model work, right? You'll get yeah, 4,000 yeah, yeah. views. It will be wonderful, but it will cost you $50,000 and bring in $300 of revenue, right? It is mm-hmm. a very hard thing to do. Okay. So what can you do on YouTube that works well? Well, you can like you know, do fun videos where like people who are known on YouTube, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, teach you how to juggle, right? And it's kind of mm-hmm. wired because it's like the science of juggling and how air resistance works. And we ended up coming up, trying to find a bunch of series, like repeatable series. And we tried to come up with a formula that worked on YouTube, which is let's get hosts who are either known or can be known, right? Mm-hmm. Let's get people who have a certain amount of celebrity, but who you don't have to pay, right? Because that gets impossible. Uh, and <gasps> oh my God, we're getting so real right now. So yeah. So let's get that kind of person and let's get a repeatable series format and let's do things that feel wired, mm-hmm. right? But are also you know, watchable on YouTube. And so we came up with a whole bunch of series and there were, you know, fits and starts. We did stuff that sometimes was sort of brand depleting. Then we did stuff that was great for the brand. And then ultimately we ended up with this channel that as I don't know how many, it had 7 million followers when I left, that was great. So <laughs> it was an interesting business and you would never have hired Nick to like start a YouTube channel. Right. I mean, I guess you like I wouldn't be your last pick, right? If if in 2016, when Wired was looking at their when Anna Wintour, who was choosing the editor in chief of Wired, was looking at her list of candidates, I don't think she was saying which of these candidates will be best with YouTube, right? And if she had been, she probably wouldn't have picked me. But it turned out to be something that worked well, like while I was there. So Mm -hmm. that was an interesting process. The Atlantic, you know, we don't have an editorial video operation. So one of the things I have to think through is do we, do we, you know, should we? Should we try to replicate what we did at Wired? Should we do something else? Like, is there a possibly, you know, revenue positive thing we could do? Okay, so that that was such an interesting question. I would love to learn more about like, you know, your interaction with Anna Wintour. And I saw you guys have a picture together and stuff like that. I love Anna Wintour. I'm happy to say that, but um, yeah, yeah, everybody, I, I love her too, but I don't know her. So. She's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, she's such an icon. Okay, so your content is extremely well-researched. How do you study a subject? How do you see the big picture as well as capturing the details? And how do you do like your creative research? Good question. So if I'm writing a magazine story, I usually end up creating like a big document, Mm -hmm. right? And it has a list of here are the things I don't know, right? It's often how Mm -hmm. I'll start at the top, right? These are the things that interest me that I don't know the answer to. Here are a list of people I can talk to. Here's a list of things I should read. And so I start to, I don't know, let's say that my topic is going to be spider larvae for whatever random reason I mentioned that earlier. I would come up with like a list of interesting questions about spiders that I don't understand. Mm-hmm. I would read, start reading stories and I would underline the names of people who seem to know a lot about spiders and I would call them. Mm-hmm. And what you eventually want to do is to get to the point where you're not getting surprised in any interview or in fact, where you're, you're starting to inform the people you're talking to, right? So I wrote a bunch of stories about Facebook and mm-hmm. 
you know, by the end of the reporting process, I would talk to people who worked at Facebook and I would know more than they did about what was happening at the board of Facebook or, you know, they would tell me things. They would be like, oh yeah, and there was a meeting in July. And I'd be like, yeah, and you know, Bob and Sally and Joe were there, right? And like, once you reach that point, you're at a good point to, to write. And then of course, as you write, you continue to report. Like, I'm not one of those people who has a fine, like a, a strict line, like you start writing, you know, I sort of just write when the inspiration hits, you know, like if I'm feeling inspired, like I don't want to do another phone call. I don't want to like read another paper. Sometimes I'll just write, you know, and I'll write a section and then you end up with, you know, pieces pieced together and you end up, I do a lot of copy mm-hmm. and pasting. There's no one right way to do it. Some people just, you know, John McPhee has written so wonderfully mm-hmm. about it and he'll only call everybody and then he'll like lie on his picnic table, look up at the sky and like, mm-hmm. then the structure will come to him. He'll sit down and he'll write it and it will be perfect. Right. You know, my process is, you know, it's much more haphazard and confusing, but the thing that I'm proud of that I think I do right is that I'm not precious about saying I can only write when I've done this, or mm-hmm. I can only report up to this point. Like, you know, I'm constantly writing and reporting and improving up until, you know, up until the end. When you are researching Facebook or when you are researching before you chat with like the 25 people who work there, like, do you just research them on Google or do you read books? Like, how does that process look like? Can you really find all the information on Google? And like, will you go into really personalized websites or like, you know, for example, if I research our conversation today, I will Google like Nick Thompson. I would listen to your interview with like Tim Ferriss or like read your book or by read, I mean, like listening to your book on Audible. So what's that process like for you? So it's, I guess it's different for the different projects, but like, you know, let's say that I was assigned, you know, if I, let's say I went back to Wired and I was writing part three of my Facebook series, right? Mm-hmm. And it's Facebook the last three years. I would go back and I would have an initial stage. You know, I would read whatever books have come out about Facebook recently, right? I would probably create a playlist in Spotify of interviews with Facebook executives. And then when I'm running or, you know, doing the dishes, I'd listen to them. Right? <laughs> I would, you know, if something really interesting comes up, I would type it into Evernote and in kind of a big doc file about Facebook. Mm-hmm. And then I would call people I'm friends with, right? What, what's tricky about reporting is like, let's say you want to call a person you've never talked to at Facebook and it's an important conversation. You don't really want to call them until you have enough information to ask them smart questions because you probably get one crack, right? And so you don't call those people early, right? You call your friends, right? You call the, you know, the friend of yours who used to work at Facebook or the friend of yours who like just knows a lot about Facebook. And you, you ask him general questions. You're like, I'm really doing this story. I'm interested in these six things. And you don't mention the stuff, the kind of secret stuff you're interested in. There's a whole art of like what you reveal and what you don't reveal in an interview. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, I used to think of it, the metaphor I sometimes think about was you like, I can't remember which Harry Potter book it is, but where you basically have to go through ever more complex rooms to get to the end, right? And there's like 10 rooms. And the way a story like Investigation to Facebook works is the truth of what happened is in room number one, right? Mm -hmm. And you start in room number 10. And what you're trying to do is to get the information that takes you into room nine, then room eight, then room seven, then room six. And you try to get as close as you can to room number one. And maybe it's impossible to actually get room number one, because even the decision makers don't know why they made the decisions, right? Mm-hmm. And, or maybe, you know, maybe Mark Zuckerberg, even if given truth serum, wouldn't exactly know why Facebook had made a certain decision, right? So it's unclear what exactly, like, it's, it's not like you're trying to get more senior people to tell you what happened. Like you're mm-hmm. just trying to get closer to the truth of what happened. And the truth of what happened is always immensely complicated. So, you know, you start in room 10 and room 10 is Google, right? And then like you start calling people and eventually you get to room nine. And then like your skill as a reporter is like gets you as close to room one as you can. So that's sometimes how I think about it. And sometimes I'm like, okay, well, I feel like I'm in room six. (laughs) I'm getting there, right? I know a lot more than I did at the beginning, but now I don't really understand. Like, I don't understand what happened. There's this consequential. I remember thinking about this. Here's a very specific example. I could not figure out when I wrote that second Facebook piece, why Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger, the founders of Instagram left. Mm -hmm. And no one would tell me. And like the answers I got didn't square. And I had like, I had little scraps of detail suggesting that the answers I had been told weren't right. And I kind of had gotten to like room eight, right? But I kept like asking and trying to figure out and trying to piece together and like trying to figure out like, seems like, I mean, I can't remember all the exact details, but it seems like something happened with Kevin in like August of that year, right? And like, based on like something that someone told me he said at this thing. And so I finally kind of figured it out, right? And I figured out what the dispute had been between them and what the instigating factor had been. And so- you know, it was this long process of talking. I probably talked to 20 people who knew the answer who didn't tell me before I finally, 
found someone who did tell me, and then I could go back to those 20 people and say, hey, now I know this, tell me more. And so that's how I sort of, did I get to room one on that question? Who knows? But I at least got to room three. That's the way the process works. I feel like if you tell them, you know, you are such a high profile writer and like, I would be really intimidated to, you know, risk my career to tell you something that like, you know, I shouldn't be telling to protect my company or to protect my salary, my family, whatever. How do you make sure that people tell you things? And how do you find like, I don't know, the 20th person to just tell you the truth? Well, you can't. I mean, you, you know, so why would someone at a powerful tech company talk to Nick, right? Well, and of course, like, I mean, I would want to be featured in some like really like high profile stuff, but like, I mean, this may not, like, it, it's controversial, right? Like you're trying to reflect the truth, not like you're trying to, you know, promote someone or shade someone, but like, I, I don't know. Well, let's, okay. So let's go to this Instagram example, right? Because right. it's an interesting example, right? So it's a piece of information, right? Like there had been an argument between the founders of Instagram and the leaders of Facebook, and it had led to what had happened. No one wanted to tell me this because for just the reason, right? Like mm -hmm. Facebook wanted to keep that quiet, right? And Instagram wanted to keep that quiet. But then someone did tell me, why did they tell me? I don't know, right? They told me, you know, maybe because they were part of the story and wanted to make sure it was accurately reflected. Or maybe they were upset or maybe they were happy or maybe they felt like, you know, just a general principle that truth is better than not truth. So then once one person has given you some information, then you talk to somebody else and then they're like, they hear what you say and they realize that you've gotten it from somebody else. And maybe there's been a game of telephone and maybe you only have it 80% right. Then they talk to you to make sure that you get closer to hundred percent. Right. And so the thing that mattered the most to me or matters the most to me is that I want everybody I talk to, to have complete and total confidence that I will do my best to portray what they said accurately. Right. And so I will often, when I finished writing the story, I will go back and I will call the people I talked to and I say, okay, I'm using this quote in the story and I'm representing it this way. Did I get anything wrong? Right. And you run the risk of having unpleasant conversations, but like, you know, it's a way to build up trust. And so I think at this point, you know, I don't think there's, maybe there is, but I think there are very few people who feel like they may not like what I wrote, or they may think that what I wrote was harmful to whatever they worked in, but I don't think they would ever say that I misrepresented what they say or that I didn't try to get at the truth. Right. Or, you know, I'm sure there are, right. It's such a complicated media environment. And I'm sure there are people who hate me for things I've tweeted or something, but like, it's really important as a reporter to do your very best on that. And I'm sure I've failed in many cases, but I've tried, I certainly try hard to get that. And to the extent I'm an editor, I will often say, you know, one of the skills as an editor, you look at a story and you say, have you talked to someone who disagrees with this contention, right? You're asserting that this happened. Have you talked to so-and-so who might have a different view, right? Like try to talk to multiple people on all the important stuff in a story. And that's, and that's how journalism should work. And, but it's, you know, it's a complicated thing to do. After you published that piece, like did, I don't know if we can talk about this, but like, did someone come after you or like, I mean, like, is there any consequences or? No, I mean, those Facebook yeah. stories, right? Were there any consequences? I mean, I mean, I can't talk about like, we no, don't have I, to talk. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, I, I think no. I mean, I, I think you can tell from the public record, right? I've just recently done public events with multiple Facebook executives. Like, I think they didn't love that information came out that they didn't want to come out. But I think they appreciated that mm -hmm. to the extent that I was able to, I tried to prevent errors from getting in the piece. And like, I went through every contentious claim in those stories with Facebook's communications department, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I went and I called somebody who I worked with very closely on those stories. And I said, okay, you're not going to like this, but like somebody told me this and I'm like, is that true or false? And they'd be like, that's false. Right. And I'd be like, okay, prove it. Or they'll say like, okay, that's true. Too bad. You got that. But they got, so they, they, you know, they, they knew there was no, it wasn't like I published something where they were like, that's garbage. This guy's a hack. How do you know, like when you talk about like the Instagram founders, how do you be like a mind reader? How do you know like, oh, this is not supposed to be like what's actually happened? Like how do you develop the sense of what's going on? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like the way you do it in any understanding, any personal relationship or, you know, when somebody tells you something, how do you know it's false, right? Like, well, maybe it doesn't quite square with something else you know to be true or... Again, back to the Instagram example, it's like both better and worse to talk about specific examples. I can't remember exactly, but I think somebody told me, someone had seen, someone who's not quoted in the story, had seen Kevin Systrom at some point in the crucial month. And like they had had an intuition that he must've been upset about something. And it like changed the timeline that I had been given. And so it made, gave me the sense that like, um, there's something wrong with the official timeline. It's just something that's not right. And so I put it on the list of things that I don't understand and like, don't believe what I'm being told. But there were a whole bunch of other things where I like had a suspicion and my suspicion was wrong, right? Or like, <laughs> as far as I know, like, you know, I finally like 
got the person who would know the truth mm. and they're like, nah, that didn't happen. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, or, you know, you know, and not quite like that, but like they would say, no, that didn't happen. And I believe them for whatever reason. So you, I don't know, there's the same sense you have about why somebody's lying to you in any context. But yeah, what makes a good reporter, and again, I'm not, there are people who are vastly better at this than I am, vastly, vastly better. Right? And it was a pleasure to work with those people, right? Like I edited some truly amazing reporters, you know, at the New York, and I worked on some truly amazing stories at Wire. The people who are best at this, it's astonishing to watch the work, right? And it's astonishing to see how they get people to talk, right? I mean, to pull one example from long ago, I remember there's a woman I worked with named Nadia Lobby at Legal Affairs, right? So 18 years ago, I remember sitting in the cubicle next to her while she was like asking someone like what had been going through their mind as they like sexually assaulted a family. And it was like, how do you get a person? And like the way she was able to like talk to the person to get them to like explain what had happened. It was one of the most astonishing things I'd ever seen, right? And that was like a level of intensity of, you know, breaking through, you know, and she would like drive off, I remember her driving off to rural West Virginia to find like to go and like camping outside the door of someone who had murdered someone she wanted to write about. Like there's a level of skill in the best reporters that is just you know, it's like watching a, you know, a 400 hitter and recognizing that you're a 250 hitter. So it's wonderful to work with people who can like get to room one much faster and get information much quicker and do a much better job at it. I have so many questions. I'm going to pause for today and then we'll continue the conversation maybe some other time. Okay. Well, it's wonderful to talk to you, Grace. Thanks for all these great questions and a great conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I hope people like listening to it. Can I ask a one minute fire round? Sure. Okay. What's your favorite book? My favorite book? is my favorite, I'm going to go with my favorite recent book, which is, or not recent, last couple of years, Strangers Drowning by Larissa McFarquhar. Who made the biggest impact in your career? My career? Either Charlie Peters, who hired me at the Washington Monthly and was my early mentor, or David Remnick, who watching and studying was phenomenally valuable. Who would you invite to your dinner party? Which dinner party? Uh, <laughs> um, at okay. this point, yeah. I'm going to invite a lot of friends I haven't seen in a year of COVID, right? I would love, I was doing this exercise recently, like who is the person I'm closest to who I haven't seen in the last 16 months? And that, those are the people I want to manage. Dinner party. Where can we find you outside of work? Outside of work, you can find me running in Prospect Park or in the Catholics. What is one piece of article that you've wrote in that you just, you're the most proud of? The story I wrote about how I became a much better runner in my 40s than I've been in my 20s and what that taught me about myself. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nick, for coming. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Have a good one.